Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents Connie Evans with her book, Valor Under Fire. Connie, uh, this is number three in a series called Colonial Life. What are other books in the series? Well, I started with the Pine Tree Riot, and that's an event that took place in Ware in 1772, which was a year before the Boston Tea Party. And uh, I, I found that, well, if you move to where you, it doesn't take too long before you hear about the Pine Tree Riot. So I was very interested in learning the details of it. And I had bought a very large book, The History of Ware, um, the 1735 to 1888. And I, I bought it from the Ware Historical Society, but I had been totally immersed in teaching. And it was one of those things that just sat on my shelves. And when I retired, I thought, you know, I really am curious about the Boston, I mean, I'm sorry about the Pine Tree Riot. I should, I should look it up. And as I was reading it, I thought, wow, that would make a nice story. So that's how I got going with that one. And then I was fascinated with a lot of the anecdotes I can imagine this um, William Little and his team of interviewers going house to house and asking people, well, do you know anything about your ancestors? Because they came up with some of the funniest little tidbits. And I took two of them. One of them was the witch of Ware and how she was blamed for everything. Mm -hmm. And the other one, um, it, the, the second short, so, and, and the book is called, um, survival in colonial America. So I took these two stories and the other one was a young man named Timothy Corliss who was abducted by Indians in the 1740s. It was before Ware was actually Ware, but it was in our area. And he was marched 300 miles to Canada. Mm. Yeah, it was a very, very hazardous journey. Mm -hmm. Especially and, since you're busy being a kidnap victim. Yeah, exactly. And I, I do an awful lot of research. Uh, I had read many books on uh, survivors of Indian abductions and if, whether they were in the Massachusetts area or the New Hampshire area, they all had similar stories. Hannah Dustin, for example, her story was very similar to some of the people from the Deerfield Mass um, ab abductions. Hmm. Um, so you, this is what got you started on the series. How many books are in the series? Three. Jo these three, do you plan yeah. any more? Well, right now I'm in my reading phase because when I write, I don't have time to read. There's, mm -hmm. your time is taken up with research as well as writing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm enjoying reading for the time being. I took a, a writing course, uh, a wonderful Zoom course for the month of October, and that just ended. And they gave us little, uh, little assignments to do, and it kind of got me going again. I needed a little motivation. But as far as coming up with what to do, I haven't decided. Okay. Uh, do you, uh, the, the whole trilogy so far uh, has been historical fiction, right? Exactly. And do you think you'll stick with that genre? I like it. I feel comfortable in it. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, well, it's obviously a genre that involves uh, research uh, and anything else that would go into uh, fiction writing. Are there any other aspects to historical fiction that maybe people don't often think about? I mean, other than you have to write fiction and you have to research history. Yeah, yeah, what, what's nice, just to throw in right away, what's nice about it is that you've got these goals, you've got to get to a certain incident hmm. or situation. And so you've got to make up how you get there. Mm -hmm. But once you're there, that's what it is, you know? So I think so, that part is kind of fun. Um, so your plotting is sort of done for you in broad limits? Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, that, that's a real plus. Um, yeah, it is. It is. Now, uh, Valor Under Fire has like 10 protagonists, real life men who fought in the Revolutionary War, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. And they, these are all, all fellows from the Ware area, I, I assume. They are. And what was very interesting about that, I can't tell you the time I spent trying to get a definitive list of these men. I, I found eight in the history of Ware, and I thought, okay, they're eight. Um, and then I went to the, um, the New Hampshire historical area, and they said in their roles, they, they had other names. And some of the names were the same. Some of the names were very different. And then I went to Bunker Hill and lo and behold, they had a different list. Mm. But um, what I did was I settled on these 10 men because I know where they were positioned at Bunker Hill. And I know that because um, I, they, they tell, all the history books say where the captains were stationed. Mm. And I know these men served under specific captains. Ah. Now, for the the meat of the events, uh, did you you mentioned uh, family anecdotes? Uh, that would be one source. And I gather you found documents uh, at least concerning the captains' of, uh, uh, connection with Bunker Hill. But did you have, for example, letters or journal entries from the men or their families? Or, I what, really, what were your oh, sorry, I'm, I, I, no, what were your sources? Oh, okay. I, usually with historical fiction, you don't need to have a bibliography or notes, but I felt it was really important to show people that many, many, many things that I had included um, were actual things that had happened. And um, so, I, I have that note section and you don't normally know when you're reading something like I was reading Lincoln in the Bardo and found out that some of it was true, some of it wasn't, but you don't know that. Mm -hmm. So I, I was uh, very anxious to let people know what was true. So I found a wonderful source, a blog, a man named J.L. Bell, and he does a daily blog called Boston 1775. Hmm. And he does all the research. It's wonderful. <laughs> he, he lives in the Cambridge area. And he goes all over giving his talks about various things. And he just digs and digs and digs. And he comes up with diaries that have been lost and found. And he... It's amazing. He's very well known. So people who, if they're cleaning their attic, I guess that they find something they know to contact him. But I mean, I got a, a, just a, a wealth of information from him. Like, what's it like to be on night guard? And mm. how did, when you think about this, all these men coming out of the woods into Cambridge and it's not an organized army. So mm -hmm. how did they feed themselves? And where did they sleep? They were, there weren't any barracks at the time. There weren't any commissaries except for Massachusetts. But our, our New Hampshire men, you know, what happened to them? So I, I had a nice correspondence with the JL Bell and he, he explained it to me. So, you know, and he, he did all the digging for me, which was really wonderful. Not that I hadn't tried, but he, he knows where to go and, and how to find stuff. Okay. Um, but well, I also did a lot of reading and diaries and papers sure. and stuff myself. Diaries. Uh, did any of the 10 men leave a diary or a member of their family? No. Oh, okay. Somebody yeah. else's diaries. Okay. Uh, I'm these ten men. Uh, can you rattle off their names and maybe tell us something about the individuals that stand out most to you, or that are your favorites? Just you well, know, three of them. Out of the ten, there are two main characters. Although you do get stories of the others. Um, Sam Caldwell. His father was 
rather well to do. He had a tavern and he had a sawmill and he became a selectman. And uh, Sam was one of the wealthier um, boys. He was also a Minuteman, Sam mm. was. Uh, he was only about 20 when he went to Cambridge. And uh, then I had Ephraim Hadley. And I didn't know, another thing I knew about Sam, usually when you're reading history, it's so one dimensional, you don't get a lot of depth at all, you know, no emotion or anything. And um, so of course all that had to be invented, except there was one line <clears throat> in the Ware history that said he was a risk taker. And mm. so in reading um, a lot of the history, I found um, different, very risky things that some people did. So I attributed one in particular to him. I see. Um, and Ephraim, I didn't know much about him, but I made him of more modest means. Um, I know that he, I, there's a genealogy also in the history of where, so I, I, I know who was married at the time and, you know, who was, had brothers and sisters. And um, Ephraim was the sole provider for quite a while. Uh, he did all the grunt work because his father had passed away and his younger brothers were, were by the time Ephraim went to um, Cambridge, his brothers were old enough that he could pass the torch um, and take care of the farm. And then their, their brothers, uh, Jacob and John Flanders. Um, there's a Moses Fallensby, and it's kind of interesting because there's also a Moses Fellows. And in those oh, right. days, there were lots of Moseses. Right. <laughs> so I couldn't uh, hmm. call well, them both right. Moses. Right. Uh, one of them, one of them became Moy. I found out M O Y. That's that was a nickname for Moses. Oh, yeah. So, and both of them were Moses F, just to make life even more complicated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I understand you have uh, some maps uh, to show us, and I gather uh, narration that goes with the maps. Would you like to? bring that up now? Well, I can tell you, um, yeah, I would like to talk about the Battle of Chelsea Creek, which is map one. It's Thank really you. an interesting battle. So when that comes up, I can explain it. There, I think we've got it up. Okay. Um, so when the British arrived, they just, you know, there was ship after ship and the, their red coats just poured into the Boston Peninsula. And they were pretty much hemmed in because they, they were only, there were narrow necks of land that connected them, uh, one to Charlestown Peninsula. And so, all these soldiers that were the militia that were pouring in um, from Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Connecticut uh, pretty much commandeered the whole land, preventing them, like I think it's a nine, 10 mile area, preventing the, the Bostonian, the, the British from leaving Boston. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, with more and more people coming, more and more men, they, their provisions were pretty limited and they could fish, but they really couldn't hunt. And uh, they began to get really antsy. They, they wanted to have fresh meat. And so they were looking out to the islands all around Boston Harbor and when the British had arrived, the, the farmers left because they didn't want to stick around. Right. And they left their animals too. It was a custom in those days to, um, you could put your livestock on these islands, didn't have to worry about fences and they grazed. And when you needed one, you just row a boat over and grab one. So the British were looking at those sheep and cattle thinking, 
there, there are the provisions we need. And of course, our men were not gonna stand for that. So this whole battle is about our men crossing all these little creeks and, and trying to get the, the livestock. And as you can see, one island is very close to Boston. So it became it, well, very hazardous. And they also, besides trying to get the animals off the islands, they also were gonna burn all the hay. Mm. And it was at that point where the British saw the smoke and they sent over 200 Marines and our men had to run back from whence they came, but they were engaged in battle. I see. Was it deemed a mistake to have tried to burn the hay or at least to burn it right then? Or did that no. ever come up? Well, apparently um, the week before another group had done it uh -huh. and maybe they felt they could get away with it or maybe they were just very daring thinking mm -hmm. that, well, we'll just run like heck. <laughs> <laughs> which, which they did in the event. Uh, they did, yeah, yeah. I see. But they, at one point they had to dig in and, and fight because they were, it, it's very muddy and rocky there and all the, the many of the British ships wouldn't have been able to go up those tiny waterways, mm -hmm. but there was mm -hmm. one called the Diana and it was a smaller schooner. And so that they, there were several, I don't know exactly how many Marines were on that, but anyway, they, they were the ones that were firing. They had swivel guns on that schooner and they were firing at our men as well as the Marines running at them on foot. Okay. Um, shall we have an excerpt? Sure. Okay. So this is after they marched five miles from Medford and they had, uh, they had um, camped the night before and Oh yeah, okay, so this is when Admiral Graves of Great Britain is alerted. So unbeknownst to the provincials at that time, Admiral Graves of Great Britain was being promoted to Vice Admiral of the White Squadron. A white flag shot up the masthead of the Preston anchored in Boston Harbor. It signaled to Lieutenant Thomas Graves, the new Vice Admiral's nephew and commander of the schooner, the Diana. The Diana was just returning from Maine and dropped anchor near the Preston to help his uncle celebrate. Sam had anticipated more action as a soldier than herding livestock. He watched as Jonathan forded the creek behind the animals and wondered how Jonathan felt about his role. He knew he had little patience with livestock. When Stark saw that the beasts were safely escorted to the far side of the creek, he gave new orders to the remaining companies. Cross over to Noddles Island. Take heed, it is closer to British occupied Boston and closer to their warships anchored in the harbor. I do not want to underestimate the inherent danger involved. We must kill as much of the remaining livestock as we are able, using only blades so as to not alert the enemy. Only when that has been accomplished shall we set fire to the storehouse of hay. I assure you, they shall pursue us, make haste back across the creek to Chelsea. Sam smiled. This is what he had been waiting for. He dug out a nut from his pocket. His finger traced a deep ridge on the shell. Then he flicked it up in the air with his thumb and index finger before returning it to his pocket. In the early afternoon, an officer aboard the Preston notified Vice Admiral Graves that he witnessed a great deal of smoke rising above Noddle's Island. The vice admiral immediately ordered his nephew to sail the Diana up Chelsea Creek to block the rebels from escaping. The larger ships could not navigate the shallow tight waterway with mudflats and rocks hiding beneath the surface of the water. He also ordered 200 Marines to chase after the rebels on Noddles Island. Sam was the fastest runner of the Ware men, but he ran behind them to shout words of encouragement. 
Ephraim was capable of long distance running, but his steady lumbering pace was not gonna keep him out of harm's way. As the others began to distance themselves from the two in the rear, Sam risked a glance over his shoulder and saw the bobbing heads of the Marines approaching over a rise. For all you hold dear Ephraim, if you want to return to your Ruth, you best move those strong legs faster, Sam shouted. Ephraim fisted his hands and pumped his arms back and forth faster than they had ever moved. For the first time in his life, he was running away from danger. The unpleasant feeling was foreign to him. He had always confronted his fears and by doing so, mastered them. However, this was the, also the first time he was running for his life. They reached Crooked Creek, a tributary off Chelsea Creek, separating Noddles and Hog Islands. They were running at a full sprint and had no time to remove shoes. The provincials forded the creek pell-mell, some pushing and shoving. Men rose and stumbled out of the churning water, coughing and gasping for breath. Keep your muskets and powder horns dry, shouted an officer. But his words disappeared amid the sounds of splashing water, panic voices, and the swivel guns of the Diana exploding at them from up Crooked Creek. Terrified birds darkened the sky to escape the thundering and clouds of smoke. Moy reached land first, but his toe caught in a small hole. He fell hard. Ephraim yanked him up with one hand while Sam swooped up his musket. Ephraim was half dragging Moy until he could manage on his own. Colonel Stark, positioned midway in the human herd, yelled and pointed to a long ditch. Approximately 200 men threw themselves into the gully and instinctively loaded their muskets. Half of the men continued running on Hog Island. Finally, an undertaking that suits me, Ephraim said, coughing and breathing heavily. Small pebbles and sand rained on their heads as their backs flattened against the earthen wall. Ephraim's steady hand retrieved a cartridge. He tore the paper open with his teeth. He primed the flash pan with a small amount of powder secured the priming charge and poured the rest of the gunpowder into the barrel. He rammed and compacted the lead ball and paper in the barrel. Ephraim was the first to turn around and face the oncoming Marines. Still steady under the pressure, he cocked the lock and waited for others to present their muskets. Firing together would improve accuracy and intimidate the enemy. A second line of rebels crouched behind the first, ready to fire and give those in front time to reload. The Marines were running shoulder to shoulder, rapidly closing the distance. Stark passed the command down to wait for his signal. When Ephraim saw Stark's arm slice the air, he felt the push of the recoil and dark gray smoke swirled above the musket. The sulfur stench stung his nostrils after the powder ignited in the pan. As a young boy learning to shoot, he had a challenge maintaining a steady musket during the delay between the blinding smoke and the ball leaving the barrel. It was second nature to him now. The day was not humid, so the smoke thinned enough for him to see. A Marine faltered. Ephraim quickly hunched to reload his musket and to let Moy rise up to shoot. The hot volley rained on the Marines who had nowhere to go to protect themselves. If Colonel Stark was shouting any commands, no one heard him above the ringing in their ears and the continuous concussive cracking of the unsynchronized firing. A ball passed through the cap of the man hunched next to Sam. A miss is a, as good as a mile, Sam winked. While the confrontation on land was taking place, the Diana was anchored and her 12 swivel guns started firing. She was far enough away that the six pound cannonballs thudded to a stop a safe distance from the rebels, but it would be a different story for them, for them when crossing Belle Isle Creek. For Reuben, the incessant booming sounded as though a thundercloud was caught in the sky directly over his head. Ephraim paid no heed to the noise and fired another round before he noticed <clears throat> the British commander had ordered a retreat back to Boston. The officer had realized that more men would be lost without having any cover to protect them. The Patriots' fire came to a halt as the backs of the Marines diminished in the distance. The men looked to Colonel Stark, who had remained steady and immune to the chaos. He turned to see that behind them, the Diana was going up the increasingly shallow and narrow creek. Advance! Then he poked at the air in the direction of the hapless ship for the benefit of those whose ears had continued ringing. 
Mm. Ephraim grinned, reloaded his flintlock and ran in a crouched position toward the Chelsea Creek side of Hog Island where he could get a closer view of the schooner. Militiamen scattered behind trees, rocks and small hills anywhere nature had provided refuge from cannonballs and a safe place to fire from. The bombardment from the Diana stop when the provincial's fire urged the schooner to sail farther up the creek. Sam realized that the outgoing tide and the dying wind would soon ground the Diana and she would be unable to turn around. They're launching longboats, Reuben said to Ebenezer as they peered over a boulder. They're fixing to tow the schooner. The sun was getting low in the sky, but they were able to count 12 longboats and discern eight to 10 oarsmen climbing into each one. A man from each boat was tying a long rope to the Diana to pull her out away from the shallow waters. We cannot allow them to reach Boston Harbor, Snark, Stark pointed in a southerly direction. Make haste, men. We can get to the mouth of Chelsea Creek before they arrive and attack them down there. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Well, yeah. Go Yankees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so would it be spilling the beans to tell us if all 10 men get through the war alive? You don't have to say if you don't think we should know. Some, some get injured. Well, okay. Yeah. And uh, is the Colonel Stark that we hear mentioned the Colonel Stark of uh, our area of New Boston and and Goffstown and and where? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, As a matter of fact, there's another captain, Captain Moore, who mm -hmm. some of our men served under, who was from Goffstown. Ah. Oh. John Moore. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, you're uh, welcome. And uh, I'm glad to hear that there's there's two other whole books in the series and maybe more coming. Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> where, um, and these books are available uh, th through uh, uh, Amazon? or They are, and I also sell them. We have okay. been going to the Weir Farmer's Market, although I think our last... Well, last Saturday is this Saturday, Halloween. Right. But we will be back out there when the weather's nice and we will be socially distant and wearing our masks. And Okay. Yep. We all it. have to. Okay. Uh, well, I am very grateful to you for coming and telling us about the book. And well, I appreciate the opportunity. Right. And uh, well, uh, we may do this again sometime. <laughs> okay, super. <laughs> thank you. So, so thank you. And uh, that's it for this time around Book Circle.